the process of changing body composition. So as you are burning fat, as you are you know making some adjustments to your body composition, some vitamin D does get lost or get compromised in that process. And a lot of this is because uh, fat soluble vitamins such as vitamin D do tend to get stored in your fat stores and so as you are turning over fat stores and whatnot some of that vitamin D tends to get lost a little bit and this is not to say that you should carry a lot of body fat so you can have higher levels of vitamin D but it does mean that you need to be more conscious of taking in more vitamin D if you are in a cutting phase if you're trying to recomposition your body if you're trying to lose weight it can be beneficial for you to try to take more vitamin D during that process simply just because you're gonna it's gonna be somewhat compromised Hello, Aaron Kubitz, personal trainer at Functional Aesthetics EC, helping average guys perform better inside and outside the gym. Today's video um, is going to be on vitamin D, but with a little bit of a different spin. So, in the past several years, vitamin D has gained a lot of attention in the media uh, due to its immune boosting, boosting properties, particularly during the pandemic period. It's also very important for the assimilation of calcium into your bones. If you don't have the right ratio of calcium to vitamin D in the diet, it's very likely that the calcium that you're taking will not be deposited in your bones. So there are numerous different benefits to vitamin D, some of them which I will cover later on in the video, but I was recently reading uh, one of my sports nutrition books and I came across some interesting stuff that would be probably very interesting to guys who are interested in strength training and gaining strength and also enhancing their recovery from their uh, athletic endeavors. So for many years, we have heard that omega-3 fatty acids are very good for your health, right? And the chief source where you get your omega-3s from is typically from fatty fish. And um, also, if you're getting grass-fed uh, dairy, beef, eggs, milk, things like that, you can also be getting some omega-3s in there as well. But the chief sources are typically sea, uh, seafoods, particularly fatty seafoods is where you're getting most of your omega-3 fatty acids. Now, omega-3 fatty acids, there are three primary forms of this. You have EPA, which is um, can be converted into DHA, uh, which is the most important form of the omega-3 fatty acids. Now, you also have ALA, okay? So DHA is uh, important for uh, brain function. It's actually um, a major component of the structure of your brain. It's also important in uh, the development of, or of your eyes because it is comp uh, part of the retina in your eyes comprised of DHA, right? So while EPA serves a variety of other functions within the body, um, it can also be converted into DHA, and DHA is probably the most important of the three different strains of omega-3 fatty acids. Now, ALA, or alpha-linoleic acid, is not your um, an actual omega-3 fatty acid, right? It has the, and you're typically getting this from plant-type foods, thus it is typically the most uh, abundant form of omega-3s in the standard person's diet, 
in, in the West. Now, in other third world countries and stuff where they tend to eat a lot more plants and whatnot, they are probably getting higher, um, they, or in third world countries and, or other countries and stuff where they get a variety of other things, they're living more in a closer state to nature, maybe they're getting higher forms of other forms of fatty acids as well. Um, I don't know off the top of my head. So, ALA can be converted into DHA, EPA, right? But the conversion process is very inefficient. Thus, you'd have to eat a lot more of the food to get the same benefit. And then you also risk having, you know, and this is something that has gained more attention in, um, in recent years with the advent of things like the carnivore diet. You have Jordan Peterson and his uh, daughter, Michaela, who had like an autoimmune dis uh, disorder that she struggled with as a, uh, from her, for her whole childhood, right? And she really benefited from completely eliminating all plant foods from her diet and just eating straight up meat. And Jordan Peterson was also having some health issues and he did the same thing and he also, you know, was having uh, some improvements in his health. And so a lot of people are saying now, and I, I've done some precursory research into this, but not enough to speak authoritatively on the topic. And, but the, the main thrust of what they're saying is that you have things like oxalates and, um, lectins that are contained in the plants, right? And so an oxalate would be something like, um, is what the plant actually used to extract minerals from the soil. So as the, uh, as the narrative goes, is that if you're eating these plant foods or eating too many of these plant foods or too high a percentage of your diet coming from plant foods as would be needed if you're trying to get all of your omega-3 fatty acids from plant foods like walnuts, flax seeds, chia seeds, um, canola oil, things like that, you'd have to eat a lot of them. And thus you'd be getting a lot of these oxalates, lectins, and all that kind of stuff into your diet. And the problem with this is, is that, um, since the function of oxalates is to extract minerals from the soil for the plant to use, that it would be doing the same thing in your body. It would be basically stripping the minerals and vital nutrients out of your body and washing them away. And then the other thing is um, lectins, right? And lectins, I learned about years ago when I was trying to fix some of the digestive issues that I was struggling with, right? So this is probably back in, I don't know, 2008, 2009 time period and stuff. And I was doing some research on this stuff. And basically what the lectins do is that they have the capacity to disrupt the tight junctions in the endothelial cells uh, in, the, in the lining of your gut, right? And thus causing leaky gut syndrome. And so then when food substrates pass through the gut lining straight into the, into the bloodstream rather than being digested first, they can cause autoimmune issues because the body mounts an immune response to these uh, substances that are getting into the bloodstream in an undigested form and the body sees them as being toxic, um, which many of them are if they're, if they're not digested right. So you end up having all these different health issues because of that. And so this is why um, a lot of people say that, you know, you should really only be eating meat products, right? And this is, uh, you know, a big thrust of the carnivore diet, right? And they said, you know, that lectins and oxalates are causing a lot of these problems. Similar to how, you know, back in the, you know, 70s and 80s, they were talking about how cholesterol and saturated fat was the cause of all these chronic diseases, heart disease, Alzheimer's, um, you know, uh, getting atherosclerosis, plaque on your arteries and whatnot. And now recent years, um, we've since found that cholesterol is dietary cholesterol has a very thin relationship to um, cholesterol in the body, right? And that your body actually makes its own cholesterol. And if it doesn't get enough cholesterol from the diet, it will make actually more of it. And that the reason that you get this uh, plaque buildup in your arteries is because of inflammation in the body and the scarring that causes this inflammatory response, which then cholesterol, one of its functions, in addition to the production of hormones in the body, is to patch up and repair damage caused by inflammation. So if you're causing more inflammation in your body by eating a lot of uh, inflammatory foods, processed uh, grains, sugars, um, eating, uh, drinking too much you know, pop, different combinations of, of, of foods, like donuts, pizza, things like that, getting uh, too much high fructose corn syrup can cause, you know, different gastrointestinal issues, right? And causing this inflammation. Stress even can cause inflammation of the body, right? And so, uh, and it's not to say that inflammation is necessarily bad, right? In fact, the first stage of the, the repair process after you, get in, after you get injured is inflammation, right? And so inflammation is not bad, similar to how cortisol is not bad, right? It's just 
the chronic or sustained uh, process of being in inflammation that is a bad thing. When you lift weights, inflammation is what triggers the response to cause your muscles to get bigger and to, to grow stronger, right? Now, if you're chronically inflamed all the time, it's gonna have the opposite, opposite effect, okay? So this is some of the, uh, the reasoning behind why a lot of people say, well, you don't wanna get too much of your, um, of your omega-3s or too much of your nutrients from plant foods simply because you're going to also be getting a lot of oxalates and lectins in there in that process which could be potentially harmful uh, in other ways disrupting our di digestion causing more inflammation so on and so forth now the one kind of caveat to this is that if you soak different plants like for example almonds beans sprouts things like that or you cook them, many of these harmful substances, like lectins, will be destroyed. Now, oxalates aren't destroyed with cooking, um, and so that could be a problem as well. And so the way that I look at it, in my personal opinion, is people have been eating uh, plant and an both plant and animal foods for thousands of years. And, you know, people weren't having all of these issues. So it's more about getting a balance in a wide variety of different nutrients than trying to completely eliminate one thing or another from your diet. And that, at least that's the way that I tend to look at nutrition. All right, so that is a pretty long intro and a pretty big rabbit trail off the topic of what I originally was starting out talking about in this video. Nonetheless, I think the information is pretty good and it kind of helps to lay the foundation and kind of clear up any questions that might come up later on in the video. The main reason <clears throat> that I brought up the topic of, of omega-3s and fatty fish is that fatty fish are also a great source of vitamin D, which is the topic of this video. We're talking about vitamin D in re regards to how it affects your athletic performance, okay? So one thing that they noticed was that taking uh, omega-3 uh, um, or eating fatty fish help to reduce muscle soreness, right? In, uh, or a condition known as delayed onset muscle soreness. So, you know, maybe you do the workout and then a couple days later, you end up getting sore from that workout, right? And the soreness happens for a variety of different reasons, um, which I kind of talked about uh, a couple of years ago in a video that I did on Facebook. Uh, and it actually has nothing to do with lactic acid buildup in the muscles. Lactic acid is actually um, a fuel source that when your body runs out of oxygen to burn, when you're in oxygen debt, it's an anaerobic fuel. So it uses your body uses lactate to fuel the functions of the body, uh, the f performance of the body when it's in oxygen debt. And as soon as your body starts recovering from that, um, even like a couple minutes after working out, most of the lactic acid gets cleared out of the muscles. So the lactic acid isn't what is causing the soreness in the muscles. Uh, it's some other things which um, I can maybe make, make another video on this or I might have even done another video on this a couple years ago on this actual channel here about this. Um, but the details are a little bit foggy in my mind right now, so I'm not going to go too deep into that. So. What I'm talking about here, though, is that vitamin D, uh, it is, the scientists were basically uh, theorizing that the vitamin D by itself might have actually been responsible for this reduction in, in muscle soreness, not simply just the, um, not simply just the, uh, the omega-3 fatty acids. So the, the omega-3s were contained in the, in the fat of the fish, but they were also getting the vitamin D, and so they decided that they were gonna do a study on this. Okay, so this study was a relatively small study. There's only eight participants in the study, so you might say, well, there wasn't enough people in there to know definitively whether or not vitamin D actually provides these benefits. But anyway, here's the study. So they had the study, and they, these were uh, people who were native to Australia, right? Which you would think people in Australia would be getting plenty of vitamin D uh, due to their, you know, position down there by the equator and all that. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's a lot of sun down in Australia. Anyway, these pairs of people were split up between, so there are eight uh, age and gender matched pairs, and um, one person in each pair complained of chronic muscle soreness or muscle pain, um, particularly after exercise, right? 
And they, at the conclusion of the study, after analyzing these people, they found that without exception, all the people that had the muscle soreness were the people who were deficient in vitamin D. Another benefit of vitamin D related to athletic performance specifically is strength. So not only are, is it going to potentially help you recover faster uh, from your workouts in the form of reduced muscle soreness. Now, as experienced exercisers know, you can continue to train if, you are, if your muscles are sore. You just can't uh, train at the same level of intensity that caused the soreness to begin with. But if you want to go, like for example, if you did like some heavy squats one day and now your quads are really sore, you could go out there and do some leisurely bike riding or some walking, um, maybe even some jogging, and that would actually be beneficial for your legs because you're not tearing the muscles down there, but you are exercising them and you are helping them to recover a little bit faster. So the main benefit of not getting sore is primarily just that you aren't, aren't feeling you know, the soreness. You're not feeling the discomfort of being sore. But another benefit of um, vitamin D supplementation is in terms of muscular strength. So there was a study that they did, and this study was actually a little bit bigger. This was on elder, elderly people. There was 976 people in the study, and they were testing hand grip strength using a dynamo dynamometer, um, which is basically, you know, uh, you, you squeeze the thing, and it has a like a scale uh, thing to register the amount of pounds of pressure that you're applying to to the grip uh, the hand grip thing. Um, this used to actually be pretty uh, popular fitness assessment back in my early days when I was doing my personal training internship at Gold's Gym. Is they would do the body fat assessment and then they would also do this you know hand grip strength thing. And uh, one of the reasons you do that is because your hand grip strength is highly correlated with your longevity. So if you have, you know, a, if your strength in your hand is really strong, you uh, have a higher likelihood of living for a longer time because it is just a metric of overall, not because hand grip strength in and of itself, but generally when your hand grip strength, strength is strong, you tend to be stronger overall in general as well. So that's one of the reasons that they, that they would measure it. Anyway, in this study, they had these people uh, doing these hand grip um, uh, assessments, right? And they found at the end of the study that vitamin D status, i.e. whether or not you're deficient or not, was highly correlated with hand grip strength. So the people who had the best um, vitamin D status had the highest strength scores with hand grip strength. And it was actually uh, basically kind of stepwise like that. So the people with the lowest had the lowest scores. The people with, you know, a little bit higher than that had the moderate le uh, moderate levels of hand grip strength and the people with the absolute best hand grip strength were the people in the uh, in the highest vitamin D status group. Okay, so now that we've established the importance of vitamin D for not only uh, reducing muscle soreness and increasing or accelerating the rate of recovery after exercise, um, in addition to improving your overall muscular strength, Let's look at some general recommendations for athletes. So athletes who are to tend to do most of their training indoors, this would be people like bodybuilders, powerlifters, uh, gymnasts, basketball players, volleyball players, uh, swimmers, um, people who are spending a lot of their time training indoors versus, you know, if you're a cross country uh, at a runner or if you are a track athlete or if you are somebody who plays soccer or football, you're probably spending a, a good chunk of your training time outside anyway. And so this is a less of a concern. But these people are the people that would be at the highest risk for uh, vitamin D deficiency. In addition to that, um, the process of changing body composition. So as you are burning fat, as you are, you know, making some adjustments to your body composition, some vitamin D does get lost or get compromised in that process. And a lot of this is because uh, fat soluble vitamins such as vitamin D do tend to get stored in your fat stores. And so as you are turning over fat stores and whatnot, some of that vitamin D tends to get lost a little bit. And this is not to say that you should carry a lot of body fat so you can have higher levels of vitamin D, but it does mean that you need to be more conscious of taking in more vitamin D if you are in a cutting phase, if you're trying to recomposition your body, if you're trying to lose weight, it can be beneficial for you to try to take more vitamin D during that process simply just because you're gonna, it's gonna be somewhat compromised. So what are the general 
um, levels of vitamin D that we should be looking for for, uh, for athletes, right? So the baseline of the bare minimum would be about 32 milli, uh, nanoliters per, um, nanograms per deciliter of vitamin D serum, uh, serum vitamin D levels, right? And it would be even better to have it up at around that 40 um, nanograms per deciliter level to be to optimize it. Additional ways that you can help to, and obviously you can take a vitamin D supplement and that can be helpful, but the best way to do it as with any other uh, sort of health intervention intervention is to try to first and foremost eat, be eating a, a quality diet that includes plenty of foods that contain vitamin D in there. Uh, a lot of these foods that have vitamin D are going to also have omega-3s, so you're going to be also getting your omega-3 fatty acids as well. A lot of them also contain protein, which is going to help you to um, accelerate recovery from athletic uh, events as well. And then just spending more time outside as well. And one of the things that I notice is that when you spend more time outside, your mood and um, your level of optimism just tends to improve, uh, regardless of the season, right? Even if you're spending more out time outside in the wintertime when it's cold. The more time you spend outside in the wintertime when it's cold, you're going to produce more levels of brown fat, um, and your body is going to adapt to those colder temperatures. And the other thing that's beneficial as well that I learned from my time when I worked outside manual labor jobs all winter long is that when I ate a higher protein, higher fat diet, such as would be uh, something you would obtain from eating a lot of grass-fed meats, fatty fish, things like that, is that I was able to tolerate the uh, cold temperatures much better. And this was not uh, because the fat was causing me to gain body fat and uh, get fatter because I was actually 10% uh, body fat or less the entire time. And when I was eating a lower fat diet, um, I actually experienced was far colder uh, in the winter time. So when I had more carbohydrates, lower fat, I would uh, have a harder time keeping my body temperature higher, right? And so uh, one of the things that I think that the reasons for this is, is that your body can use that fat in your diet to use to burn for energy, right? And fat has a lot more uh, energy in it than carbohydrates or protein do. Now, the other thing is, is that you when you have the combination of fat and protein together, Protein has a big thermic effect, right? So 30% of the calories in the protein that you eat are gonna be burned just trying to assimilate and digest that protein. So you're gonna be producing a lot of heat just trying to digest it. And to offset this, if your goal is not to lose uh, body fat, if your goal is to be uh, is athletic performance or even building more muscle, is to increase the percentage of fat. So instead of having lean cuts of meat, having a little bit fattier cuts of meat, and specifically getting the fatty cuts of meat from the grass-fed sources, from fatty fish, so that you're not only just getting more fat and more calories, you're also getting these beneficial nutrients like the vitamin D and the omega-3s, uh, specifically the EPA, and most significantly, the DHA, which we talked about before. Okay, so now that we have established the benefits of taking vitamin D, what are the recommended daily intakes for adults in the United States and more specifically, athletes? So the general recommendations for uh, vitamin D intake in the United States today is 600 international units per day. However, and I guess if you look at the National Institutes of Health, their recommendations is anywhere between 400 to 800 international units per day. and the 400 units is, tour, is you know, with people, uh, infants, zero to 12 months of age, and then the higher recommendations is people who are 70 years of age and above. Now, with a considera consideration of uh, what I talked about before, how athletes tend to deplete their vitamin D stores a little bit more than the average population, athletes, the recommendations for athletes are a little bit higher. The other thing that you want to uh, take into consideration as well is that the um, recommended dosage is the typically the amount that is needed to avoid deficiency symptoms. It is not the amount required for optimal performance. So other sources will say maybe anywhere between four up to four to five thousand international units per day for ath for athletes, and even as high as ten thousand international units per day uh, of vitamin D during the winter months to help to stave off vitamin D, D deficiency symptoms. Now. It is not recommended that you go above 10,000 IUs per day uh, because there are symptoms of toxicity that can arise from doing so, which I will cover a little bit uh, more later on in this video. 
So some of the symptoms of vitamins, uh, vitamin D toxicity include things like nausea, vomiting, and confusion. So these are some symptoms that can come from other issues as well. So you have to kind of, you know, do process of elimination to determine if vitamin D is the most likely culprit and actually probably the best thing to do would be to actually go to a doctor if you are uh, experiencing any of these issues because you know, there are a variety of conditions that can have similar symptoms and so you have to look at the broad scope of things, not things in isolation. So there's a couple of, a uh, couple more things that I want to share in this video, but before I move on, I do want to uh, share an anecdotal story about the vi benefits of vitamin D in my own personal experience. So traditionally, I'm not a big advocate for supplements, right? I believe in getting most of your nutrients from your diet, from the foods that you're eating, uh, and living an overall w uh, good lifestyle. I believe that supplements are just that. They're supplements to supplement your already good healthy lifestyle, right? They're to kind of add the icing on the cake. They cannot come uh, replace uh, the food that, and the nutrients that you're supposed to be getting in, in your diet to begin with. And furthermore, the reason why you shouldn't just eat the standard American diet or eat a uh, diet high in processed foods and then just add some vitamin supplements to it to try to offset the nutritional dif deficiencies that you are experiencing is because the the way that the food, that the vitamins and minerals are bound within the food themselves increases the, abil your, the, the ability of your body to actually absorb those vitamins and minerals from, from the food, right? And so if you take a vitamin or mineral in its pill form, in, its extra, in isolation, right, it is not going to be absorbed nearly as well um, as taking it from actual food substance, right? And then there, you also have to take into this consideration as well that different vitamins and minerals have different interactions with each other as well so that if you're taking a extremely high amount of one vitamin or mineral, it could throw off the balance of your nutrient status in another vitamin or mineral. So with that being said, I went to a, um, I went to a, uh, a clinic to get some blood work done, right? And one of the things I noticed when I got the blood work back was that my vitamin D levels were down around like the 2% range of what they should be, I guess. And this, I was like, wow, I need to get on some vitamin D, right? And some of this could have been due to the fact that I have struggled with digestive issues, right? Uh, um, irritable bowel syndrome, things like that for the majority of my adult life. And so people who have compromised gut health tend to be also deficient in various vitamins and minerals as well, simply because you're not just, you're not assimilating your food as well, you're not digesting your food as well, right? And so uh, that could be part of it, right? The other part of it was that um, for many years, I had jobs where I was outside all the time. But when I did this uh, blood work, I had not had a job where I was working outside for about five years. And so most of the time, I would be, uh, uh, be at work by six o'clock in the morning, so before the sun was up, and then I would be um, getting off of work, you know, around two o'clock in the afternoon. So I could technically go out and do things that outside, but I was hustling, working on building my business. So I'd get home, I'd start working on the computer, doing stuff, you know, researching things and everything like that. And... Uh, by the time I got done with that, the sun would be down. Now, in hindsight and retrospective, I probably should have spent more time taking some breaks, worked a little bit later, and taken some time to get outside in the sunshine while and taking advantage of, of that. And in fact, that is what I currently do now. And I find that rather than going and sitting on the couch, reading a book or watching Netflix or something when I'm taking a break from working, if I go outside and I just lay down on the grass you know, uh, bring out a notepad, maybe a book, just in case I feel like reading out there if I'm gonna be out there for a while, or if I'm just gonna do some breath work or something, or just simply just sitting there. Sometimes sitting there without distractions, I get a lot of great ideas, and simply being out there in the sun, when I come back inside, I'm far more alert, far more energized, and I have way more energy to complete my tasks than if I just stayed inside. So, uh, again, that is another plug for why you should try to get most of your vitamins and minerals 
uh, naturally. So getting getting outside, getting the sun, getting the fresh air versus taking a vitamin supplement. In the winter time, if, especially if you live in the northern latitudes, it is a good idea to take uh, vitamin D supplements, especially you know during those winter months, right? Because the sun is going down early, the sun comes up later. A lot of times you're just at work the whole time and so you rarely get out in the sun and so it's a good idea to up your intake of fatty fish. Not only is that going to help you to stay a little bit warmer in the winter months, you're also going to be getting more uh, vitamin D, which is going to be helping you to compensate for the vitamin D that you're not getting uh, from being outside in the sun. And then on top of that, if you'd like, because not everybody wants to eat uh, fish every day or multiple times a week, right? You can be supplementing, uh, take a vitamin D supplement or try to get some grass fed, uh, you know, beef, grass fed, um, you know, uh, free range eggs, grass fed, um, you know, milk, so milk from cows that are, you know, free ranging, eating grass and things like that. And that can also help to boost your vitamin D status. But what I noticed after I started taking vitamin D supplement, um, and I was taking a couple, like about 2000 IUs per day, um, actually not every day, but just a couple times a week, I take 2000 international units of vitamin D and that like drastically improved my immune system. So, uh, my whole childhood, I had suffered from uh, chronic uh, upper respiratory infections. I would get sick and be on the couch sometimes for a month straight, um, you know, just being very sick with that, you know. And um, even into adulthood, you know, I would get, you know, multiple uh, colds, you know, um, and flu and that kind of stuff during the winter months. And uh, when I took the vitamin D, I didn't get sick that entire, that entire winter when I took the vitamin D. So that made me think this is one supplement that might actually be really good to take and i am now a believer in taking good quality vitamin d supplements i actually the one that i take um is this one right here uh dr berg's vitamin d um supplement he's pretty uh pretty popular guy uh some people like if you're going to follow him for uh, exercise advice or strength and conditioning stuff or those kind of things, uh, there's probably some better sources out there uh, for for that kind of information. But if you are just want holistic health information, he has some pretty good information out there. Uh, has a lot of uh, a lot of experience in 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 that field and has a lot of great information uh, for you to look at. So uh, check out some of his stuff, and definitely um, if you are in that condition where you spend a lot of time indoors, definitely consider taking a vitamin D supplement. I think it will help. Okay, so in wrapping up this video, there are two different forms of vitamin D. You have vitamin D2 and you have vitamin D3. So vitamin D2 is only available uh, through prescription from a doctor. While vitamin D3 is available over the counter, you can find it in most health food stores and pharmacies. Now the interesting thing is, is that vitamin D3 is actually absorbed better by the body and so it would be the pre preferred form of vitamin D3 to take. Other benefits of vitamin D that you may be interested in is that it helps to decrease inflammation, helps to boost the immune system as I talked about before. It also helps to increase uh, testosterone. So um, if you have low vitamin D levels, it can affect your testosterone levels as well. And this is why having a good balanced diet from whole foods and getting a variety of different foods and different nutrients can enhance and improve your athletic performance overall. It's not just about counting specific macronutrients, you know, carbohydrates, fats, and protein. You also want to make sure that the quality of where you're getting those uh, carbohydrates, fats, and proteins coming from is also a good source as well. Because if you're, uh, because certain vitamins and minerals, right? For example, B vitamins um, help you to metabolize your carbohydrates, right? And then the fat soluble vi vitamins also help you to, uh, you know, metabolize your fats. And um, so if you're not getting enough of these micronutrients in the diet, you're not going to be as efficiently utilizing and uh, uh, utilizing these macronutrients. And it can also even tend to cause things where you, uh, your body gets a s sense of a false signal of uh, that you are in a deficit when you're not, causing you to retain more fat. And this is more anecdotal and, you know, some things that I've heard over the years and stuff like that, but uh, definitely have seen some instances of certain things like this happening where, you know, because of the signaling that the body is getting, the body, even though it's not in a calorie deficit, will tend to behave as if it is in a calorie deficit simply because of these nutritional deficiencies. All right, guys, that's all I've got to say today. Uh, 
for vitamin D. Hopefully you found some good insights in that you did not know yet about vitamin D um, and how it can help you to improve your performance in the gym and just your overall health. Because remember, at the end of the day, it's nice to you know get stronger, build more muscle, run faster, jump higher, run longer, all these kind of things that we love to do as fitness enthusiasts, but you can't do them uh, if you don't have good health, right? And so first and foremost, your health should be the, your top priority. And then, uh, and you know, that's not to say that a lot of the things that are going to help you to burn body fat, lose body fat, build more muscle and perform better are the tenets of health, but many of them are not, right? And so you don't want to be cutting corners and focusing just on the aesthetic benefits or uh, uh, of of your exercise regimen, i.e. building more muscle or losing fat or how your body looks, which tends to be what a lot of people tend to focus on, but you want to be focusing on your health as a whole. And so if you're interested in a holistic approach to your fitness, whether it's building muscle, losing body fat, improving athletic performance, just improving your health in general with kind of health tips like this, and then helping you to, uh, work around injuries should you sustain them in the course of your athletic journey, how to prevent those injuries from happening in the first place, consider subscribing to the channel by hitting the button in the lower right-hand corner of the screen. And we'll see you all next time for more health and fitness information.